Welcome to Restore, a podcast seeking to restore the vision, restore the mission, restore the church. And now your host, Javier Diaz. Hello, everyone, and welcome or welcome back to the Restore podcast, a podcast seeking to help restore the vision, restore the mission, restore the church to what God would have it to be by His grace. My name is Javier, and I'm your host. On today's episode, I had the pleasure to speak with Pastor Sean Boonstra. As many of you will know, Sean Boonstra is the speaker director for The Voice of Prophecy. His broadcast and books have been a source of inspiration around the globe, and over the years, his live events have been presented on every continent except Antarctica. Each week, he hosts The Voice of Prophecy's flagship broadcast called Authentic. The program seeks to pursue the existential questions of the human experience, providing biblical answers to universal questions and dilemmas. Prior to coming to The Voice of Prophecy in 2013, Sean served as an Associate Ministerial Director at the North American Division, where his role was to inspire, train, and equip pastors and churches for evangelism. Before that assignment, he served for seven years as the Speaker Director for It Is Written, In his early pastoral career, he served as a speaker director for It Is Written Canada and pastored a number of churches in British Columbia. As I often say here and believe this conversation is definitely one as well, in which you will be blessed, inspired, and perhaps challenged as well. Before we jump in, a reminder to make sure you check out the show notes for links that we mention and more. So without further ado, Here's my conversation with Pastor Sean Boonstra. Pastor Sean Boonstra, welcome to the Restore Podcast. Hey, man, I'm pretty excited to be here. It got me out of going to the uh, rest of the office today and working. This is more fun than work. Well, I appreciate that. I'm really excited about this conversation. I've been wanting to have this conversation with you with some time. We've been going back and forth, and uh, I appreciate you taking the time to get on and Uh, putting work off there at the Voice of Prophecy aside for just a few moments. And uh, so thank you, Sean. Again, delighted to have you on the podcast. And with that said, man, I'm just going to jump in as I normally do. I'm really looking forward to hearing a little bit more about your personal story. So tell us about your faith journey and your call to pastoral ministry. Well, it is a long one and we could probably kill three hours. But if I were to give you a, a thumbnail, Uh, I was born in northern British Columbia to Dutch immigrants. So I grew up in an immigrant community, went to a Dutch Calvinist church, a Dutch Calvinist school, and uh, I learned to read the Bible uh, there. As a matter of fact, I learned to read by reading the Bible. That was my first book. Hmm. Uh, But it didn't really stick. By the time I'm a teenager, I, um, well, I, I don't go into the gory details, but let's just say I consider myself a recovering heathen today or hedonist even, even a recovering hedonist. I went pretty wild from about 14 to 21 or so. Um, and then um, it, it's some a string of things started to happen. I remember when I was 16 and, and the community was kind of talking about the fact that, you know, Sean is uh, Sean's going a little uh, off, the, off the wild edge there. Uh, a lady grabs my arm outside the church one day. And looks me in the eye. I didn't really know her. And she said, it doesn't matter how far away you run from Christ. He's going to come for you. And she walks mm. away. And I'm like, okay, okay, you weirdo. Um, and then one night I come home from the pub. You know, I was out with my friends. And I get to my apartment and my Bible is sitting on my bed. And it's the one my grandmother had given me when I left home. I left home pretty young. Yeah. Um, I went to my roommate. And I won't name him to save his dignity. but. No, yeah. I said, Hey, man, were you in my room? Did you pull my Bible off the shelf? And he started laughing at me. And if you knew this guy, let's call him Mike, just we'll, we'll just, okay. if you knew Mike, you'd know why he was laughing. His, his grandmother used to mail him a joint and a birthday card for his birthday. I mean, he was the least religious guy I knew. And he just laughed. I thought, How did that end up there on my bed? And I sat down and started to read it a little inebriated um, and thought, There's something here. And, you know, that story grows and grows and grows. But finally, you know, I, I start reading it. I start studying it. I start remembering what I was taught. And one night I'm sitting on the back porch of my little rental house in tears because my ambition in life was to run for public office. I just wanted to be a politician. Really? Oh, praise God. I didn't go into that field today. I mean, oh my goodness. They'll drag you and your family through the mud. But 
I'm in tears. I said, okay, Lord, here's the deal. Because I've been hearing this little whisper, oh, you are not going to run for office. And I'm arguing with that little silent voice saying, oh, I am. That's my life's ambition. If I can't be the premier of British Columbia, I'm going to be the finance minister. I'm going to be some. And, uh, and then I made a deal with God. I'm in tears. And I said, okay, if you're real, then I want to find the people that believe what I've been reading in here. I'd stumbled over the Sabbath. I'd even stumbled over the mark of the beast and the mm. little horn power and all the prophetic stuff that Adventists love to preach. I'd found it ahead of time. And I'm reading this stuff thinking, all right, there's something in this book. And I told the Lord, if you want me to go into the ministry, then you better show me where the people are that believe what I've been reading. Hmm. And the next day, my brother calls me. He got a handbill in the mail to an Adventist meeting, an evangelistic meeting. And so we go, and six weeks later, my girlfriend and I, that's Jean, my wife today of 30 plus years, hmm. uh, we're standing in the baptistry together. The pastor was like seven, almost, well, he was a tall guy, six foot seven. Wow. And he put us both on one arm. And I discovered you better be six foot seven to try that. I tried that with candidates and you will <laughs> lose one, man. But <laughs> he, he did that. Um, and then the oddest thing happened. I finally am ordained. I mean, I'm condensing years of, 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 of journey here. But a relative who's not an Adventist comes to me and says, you understand that before your grandfather died, he pray earnestly every day that you would be a preacher. I was floored. Absolutely wow. floored. Can't wait for the kingdom. It's like, hey, Opa, Dutch, you know, we're Dutch. But hey, Opa, guess who's here? You know, and, and the day he died, he probably uh, gave up hope. You know, it's like, okay, there's nothing coming out of that kid. But uh, anyway, there, there it is, you know, years and years in, in three or four minutes. Wow. So you have this experience mm -hmm. of... Asking God, I, I, I'm always fascinated when we ask God these questions, right? Specifically, show me somebody who believes what I'm, you know, learning. Yeah. And then God presents this flyer. You go to these meetings, you get baptized. Right. What is life like now, right? So you have that oh. experience. Your life has changed. You're dating your current wife now. Praise the Lord. So, yeah, tell us a little bit about that part of the journey now. So you've well, accepted Jesus, you've accepted the message. Yep. The, um, the, the pastor who baptized us was a second career pastor. He'd been a general contractor, went into the ministry after 40, and was a soul winner. He took his church from like 70 or 80 in attendance to like 400 almost in about a year and a half. Um, just a real soul winner. And he put me to work right away. And this is a mm. key part of what I believe in ministry now. Likely because of that, um, or at least largely due to that, he put me to work right away. I gave my first Bible study three weeks after my baptism, and I held my first evangelistic meetings three months after my baptism. Wow. Um, and he enabled me. He equipped me. He let me do it. He coached me quietly in the background uh, and set me loose. And I've been doing it now for 31 years. Mm, powerful. Um, discipleship, right? We're going to talk about that in Look, a few moments. That's it. That's yeah. it. Yeah. And so you briefly touched on it, but ultimately when you accept the call to pastoral ministry, tell us a little bit more about that journey. And Well, um, yeah, I felt, yeah, go ahead. I felt a little, uh, it's like, oh boy, why did I make that deal? Because now I'm in, no, now God answered the prayer and now I guess I'm doing this. It's funny, when, when I, I made that deal with God on the back porch of my house. If you want to visualize it, it's nighttime. I'm looking at the stars. I'm smoking a cigarette while I'm making this deal with God. <laughs> and, um, and as soon as I made the deal with God, uh, I go inside, even though this voice had been bothering me, I call Jean, who's today my wife, and I say, you know what? I don't think I'm going to run for office. I got this feeling I'm going to be in ministry. And she says, well, I've known that since the day I met you. Wow. It's like, okay, how does it, well, you know, women read us far faster than we sure. can read them. Yeah. Um, and she knew it. Um, and the church that baptized me hired me as their associate pastor that like within a year of my baptism, because I was out, out soul winning. And, um, it was, I had the time of my life. The conference recognized it. They sent me on the road to do Bible work with five different evangelists. So I went and did meetings with Ron Halverson, and I went and did meetings with Dan Bensinger and Leo Screven and a bunch of others. It's like, mm. he just, it was Don Watts, uh, or, uh, Ron Watts, rather, the conference president, um, who sent me out to do these things. And it was the best training ever. I just, 
became a shadow to full-time evangelists. Uh, then I sent, packed me off to the cemetery, says seminary. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, then I, um, I took a district. Well, I took it for a while. I took a district with three churches and two companies. Half of the Alaska highway was my territory. Wow. 15 hours to drive across my district. Then it is written. Canada, um, was looking to replace Henry fire Robin, who was getting ready to retire. And so I ended up there and from there to it is written international, uh, a couple of years at the NAD in the ministerial department after I had a bout with a serious illness. And then. Ten years ago, yeah, about ten, ten and a half years ago now, the NAD president, Dan Jackson at the time, said, look, we have a choice. We're either going to shutter the voice of prophecy or would you be interested in taking it? And I said, no, why would I touch that? You know, hmm. are you kidding me? Voice of prophecy, $2 million in debt and 170 employees down to 13. And wh wh why would I touch that? Well, I couldn't sleep all night. I thought, how do I look HMS in the eye in the resurrection and tell them I didn't even try? Wow. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's how I ended up here. So there you go. There's decades of ministry path. Uh, but basically, the church that baptized me hired me. I've said this a million times here over the course of the years, and I so enjoy hearing people's stories of their faith journey and the cases, again, of pastors, ministers, their specific call to ministry. But of course, even those that, that aren't specifically called to pastoral ministry, just they're called to their specific field of work that God has blessed them with and gifted them with. But I want to go back, before we go into the voice of prophecy right? and what you took over, I'm often interested in that first experience now in pastoral ministry, right? We have a lot of pastors that listen. And so now right. you're in the local church. right? How does that transition feel for you in your first district? What was that like? Well, it didn't change a whole a whole lot, and okay. it wasn't Alaska. I need to be clear for any Canadian that might be listening in. Okay. It's Northern British Columbia. It's the okay. Alaska Highway. So Dawson okay, Creek. Okay, maybe I misunderstood. I apologize. Oh yeah, I don't know. No, no. The, the Alaska Highway runs from Dawson Creek in British Columbia, thirty hour drive to Anchorage, and the first half of that was me. Got it. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I get into the district, and I didn't change anything. Ellen White in Testimonies, Volume 9, page 19, says, We are to allow nothing else to absorb our attention but the preaching of the three angels' messages. Mm. She says, There's nothing else. There's nothing else that's a priority. And I had already come under the conviction that a soul winning church is not a church where all the squabbles and the problems disappear, but they diminish greatly. When you're doing what God raised the church up to do, a lot of the squabbles, uh, don't stop. So I was holding three or four campaigns in my district every year. Uh, you know, much to the frustration of some people who, who wished I would become like the local school administrator or something, but I just mm. like, I didn't stop soul winning and the churches grew. And, um, is in one town, our church was significant. We, we were 10% of the town's population. Wow. <laughs> and yes. Which, you know, only 1500 people in town, yeah. but I had a church of 150 in there. And, I just kept going at what I believe God calls us to do. You know, the lost don't have what we have. And I understood that if you can create an appetite for helping people, what is it? Steps to Christ, page 80, Ellen White says, the only way to grow in grace, not one of the ways, but the only way to grow in grace is to disinterestedly help those who need us. And uh, if you can get your church members doing that, I'd say 80% of the interpersonal squabbles and the foolishness that we wring our hands over just evaporate. So I, I kept it the soul winning. And of course, mm. I still had to do nominating committee and those kinds of things, have week of prayer at the school and those kinds of things. But I don't know. I've been consumed by the fact that the people I left behind are still out there without Christ. And if we could get the fear out of our churches so they're not afraid to meet these people, half of them are on the verge of the kingdom, man. The work's mm. half done by the time they show up in our church door. God did it. Absolutely. God always going before us, the Spirit of God yeah. going before us and with us and in us. Sean, thank you for sharing that. I love that. I love the essence of, and I would have to agree with you, if we could empower ourselves, beginning with myself. It begins with my journey, and, and that's why I always ask that same question. And we're all on a journey. Nobody's arrived, right? But I love the fact that the essence is, to get our churches to be focused on reaching people for Jesus. That's it. You know, one of the, one of the th traps we've fallen into, and it's not an Adventist trap, it just seems to be an American Christian trap, 
Um, and having come to America from outside, I find American Christianity very curious thing. <laughs> you know, globally, we're different here than the rest of the world when it comes to the practice of Christian faith. But there's a consumerism mentality that has crept into most churches, not just ours, where the pastor is there to perform. Mm -hmm. All right, entertain us. Is that sermon entertaining? Was the music entertaining? Was the Where the biblical model is that the pastor should be able to make themselves redundant. You should be able to leave and the church barely notices when you've done your work because they are running the church. They're doing the mission. They're the ones leading souls to Christ. And you can move on like Paul did. Let's get another church going here. Hmm. With that said, let's transition just a little bit now with voice of prophecy, as okay. uh, you were talking about. We're going to go back to what you were just mentioning here in a moment. Uh, but with that, you mentioned HMS Richards, right? Any yep. person within our community of faith will will know about HMS Richards and voice of prophecy. But for those not that if you're may, under 30, not if you're under 30, that's, that, that's what I was going to go for yeah. those that may not, I wasn't going to give an age range, but let's say for those perhaps under 30 that haven't Googled it or haven't searched for it. Tell us about the voice of prophecy, how it started and uh, yeah, where it's at today. Sure. Um, HMS Richards, a young uh, preacher. He actually is from here in Loveland, Colorado. He was there, I believe, the first graduate over here at Campion Academy, about five miles from where I'm sitting. He was baptized in a lake that's at about a mile from where I'm sitting, Lake Loveland. I walk past it when I come to the office in the mm. morning. I walk five miles to get here some days. And, um, and he's the first valid. He comes back the next year, first valedictorian. He starts holding meetings along the front range of Colorado here. And eventually ends up in Los Angeles, and he's looking at technology. You know, we're in the 1920s here, uh, and you know, shortwave radio. I'm still a shortwave junkie. I'm one of the last holdouts. Hmm. It was the internet of 1920, you know, yeah. shortwave radio. And he figures, why well, I could get into every house in town if I went on the air. So he 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 modifies a chicken coop in his backyard. He's in California at this point, and he makes recordings in an old chicken coop and sends them off to Canex Radio in 1929. It was called the Tabernacle of the Air, a real 1920s show. Yeah, uh, and it takes off. It goes national in very short order, and uh, then globally in very short order. And he was a prince of preachers. He was really one of there were really only four media faith-based personalities in the early days of, of Christian media. You had Billy Graham in the 40s, 49, from his big meeting in L.A. forward. You had uh, Bishop Fulton Sheen. Uh, you had a missing one. And you had HMS Richards. There was another one. And as soon as we're done the podcast, that name will pop into my head. That's the way that works. <laughs> but so in 1942, I think it was Fortis Dedimore who said, we ought to offer a Bible course with this. People love this show. And so he opened the Bible School of the Air. These things eventually become uh, the Voice of Prophecy and the Voice of Prophecy Bible School, which we still run in 70 languages globally. The Bible School, we are the Bible School, the official one for the General Conference and the North American Division. And we've got two buildings here. That has grown to the extent that it takes 20,000 square feet down the road from me here just to hold the resources uh, that we've got for soul winning in the Bible School material. Wow. So it just grows and grows and grows. It went through hard times for a little bit after Lonnie Meloshenko uh, retired from the Voice of Prophecy a few years back, and it started to fall apart. And as I mentioned earlier, at one point, they were thinking, is it over? Should we close the doors? Uh, and I prayed about it all night. I thought, the worst thing that can happen is they still close the doors. You'd be an idiot not to take this. <laughs> you know? um, and when I showed up, I thought, we're going to do the one thing that matters. This isn't about media. I'm an introvert. I don't want to be on the radio. I don't want to be on TV. I don't like it. I don't like watching myself. I don't like standing up front. I don't even enjoy preaching, which surprises some people. Hmm. Um, the reason to do it is souls come to Christ. So yeah, okay, I'll do it. Lord, yeah. then give me the ability to do it. I'll do what's uncomfortable. But when I go to the voice of prophecy, it's going to be about soul winning, but not our soul winning. We're going to turn it on its head. We've grown this mentality that the churches exist to support these big ministries in the church. And that's backward thinking. It's not New Testament at all. So we flipped it around. And for the last 10 years, we have said, we're here to support the local church. We've developed top tier, 40 some resources, the ones I use in the field. These aren't second string materials. We're giving the store away. We just want to help churches succeed and find the joy 
that God intended for a congregation to have when they're doing what he called them to do. So, yeah, do we do media? Yeah, I do a weekly TV show, a weekly radio show. Uh, but that's all just to send people through the doors of a local church and then to have the church know what to do when those people show up. So tell us a little bit about what are some of those cron- what are some of the concrete ways in which the voice of prophecy within those resources that you mentioned is helping to connect and to reach and to make disciples and empower the local church. So perhaps unpack that a little bit, right? Yeah, so oh, much has really. obviously changed over the course of time. Right. And so how how are how is the voice of prophecy helping that local church to be relevant in today's world? Yeah, sure, absolutely. And, and some of it will come as a surprise. And the word "relevant" tends to set people up for let's dispense with it, with anything that's older than five years. Well, no, if it's still relevant, it still works. So there are probably I could spend two hours with you just unpacking what we've developed for churches to use yeah. and the coaching and so on. But in a thumbnail sketch, it really sits on four pillars: the Bible school. And uh, here's what I find interesting. Are we're using social media and online Bible schools. Any church can have a tailored website for their church through the Voice of Prophecy where they can offer online Bible stuff. And that's more popular than people think. Yet what I find interesting is 70% of the general public who asks to study the Bible want printed paper lessons. I can't believe it. 70% of the American public prefers analog. Mm. Yeah, that's like, really? And I'm still a little floored by that. So we've got that, and we've got 2,167 schools running in the North American division right now, as I said. Then we've got family and uh, outreach. Jean runs Discovery Mountain. She's got 4.1 million kids listening to that now globally. We're hearing from kids in China and places you can't normally reach, uh, but all across uh, this country as well, 4.1. One million. She grew that thing on her own. She has a week of prayer that schools can run. It's plug and play if you can't afford a speaker. Well, Jean, Jean has built something that the kids know. They know Discovery Map. Let's, um, let's harvest decisions for Christ while they're young with something they recognize and love. She created a vacation Bible school that a church can invite the community. Those kids out there are listening. I mean, we're hearing from everybody, even Salt Lake City. Someone over there called us and said, hey, would you mind if we distributed Discovery Mountain on Mormon digital platforms for all our kids? It's like, yeah, yeah by all means. You know what? Those kids will be having us in 10, 20 years. Let, let's do that. And, and Discovery Mountain is only audio. Is that correct? Or correct me if I'm wrong. It is just, it is audio. It's uh, mostly podcast. Um, it's on radio stations all over the world. Hmm. Uh, we know that because we hear from audiences in South Africa. Could you translate this into Afrikaans for all of our kids? And Mennonites in Brazil called us. Can we have this in Plattdeutsch? It, it's gone global. And so it's a recognized brand. We just went on the air across the, uh, across the island of Ireland in both the Republic and in Northern Ireland. And, uh, and the radio station got so excited, they called us back and said, man, can we air this twice a week? Hmm. You know, the, so that's gone very well. So we've got the family outreach. Um, then I have a lot of bridge and entry events. I tend to study what are people consuming in media? You know, I go, well, there's a movie theater two uh, blocks behind me and I know I'll get eat for this, but I go and look at all their movie posters. How are they selling and what's the idea they're selling? Because mm-hmm. they're packing this place out. And then we pick topics of general interest and we give pastors a tool where we will spend the money to create top drawer documentary style, 30 minute videos, four of them. And then the pastor leads a discussion group and we invite them into Bible study. So we have all these bridge events, shadow empire, final empire. That one was popular. My goodness, people ran that over and over and they will again this election year. Is America about to collapse is the theme of that documentary. Mm -hmm. Um, And, uh, my goodness, packed out. So we've got the bridge events. So pastors who don't want to do a full message campaign, uh, they can pack the house out. 85% of people who use those bridge events ask us what else we've got. It's working fairly well. 85 I'll take. You know, I expected 40% loved it. Um, mm-hmm. And then full message evangelism. People say, you still preach a five-week campaign? I sure do. Um, and, and people come. Yeah, they come. Do they stay for a month? Yeah, they stay for a month. As a matter of fact, I've never seen more hungry audiences than I have in the last two years. It's mm. it's going better than it ever has if you do it the way we were counseled. I know people have bad experiences with full message evangelism. 
But I've built this so that these are literally the sermons I've been using for 30 years, plus coaching, saying, here's what you're going to say. Here's what an atheist hears when you say the following sentence. Mm. Here's what a Pentecostal hears when you say the following sentence. Here's why you're preaching what you are. Here's the one decision you're going for today. And so it's full message preaching, but with coaching, training, and we have a support team of 40 Mm. to help you do that. So I'd like to follow up on that last point there on the full message evangelism, right? And yeah, I'm of the belief that we just need to do evangelism of, of every single kind, right? And That's allow right. the Lord to lead however God wants to use people and however the local church wants to, wants to do it, along with discipleship, of course. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. But when it comes to the right. full-scale evangelism, you say, you know, the four weeks, and you oh, said, yeah. if, if, if we only do it right, so maybe unpack that for those that are listening. What What is doing it right for you? Um, doing it right. Look, I started out doing it by trial and error, and I made some colossal mistakes. Because it was exciting and because I started in a place where one third of Canadian atheists lived, you know, I had a very secular audience. Mm-hmm. Man, I used to pull out the little horn in Daniel 7 on night number three, and well, it was like throwing a bucket of ice over the audience and they couldn't get enough. They, we knew there was something wrong with organized religion. Moving to America, I learned pretty quick, you don't do that. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, so then you've got to ask yourself, if I've got an audience, I don't know. If I've got an audience, I don't know. They come from every walk of life. The number of seculars in that audience is rising. What do I say and when? And wouldn't you know, uh, we've got counsel on that. Um, it's in early writings. I think, uh, look at that. Uh, Hap- just happened to have it printed out for you. <laughs> Early writings 258 and 256. Read those pages sometime where Sister White tells us, look, God led us along step by step. Those are the very words. And I get those from people who are baptized. They say, man, you led us in step by step. I'm thrilled when they say that. What did she say? She said, follow the order that God used to teach us this message in the first place. So how does it start? William Miller, the soon uh, signs of, of Christ's coming, you know, he's coming soon. Uh, I'll do four nights of that and you'll pack the place out, especially now, you know, what's going on in Gaza, what's going on in Europe. It's like, yeah, that, that topic never gets old. Is there something going on in this world? Then a gospel presentation. And then from there, you follow the order that we learn this in the first place. And it doesn't even make logical sense to me some days, but it works. It absolutely works. Sean, I'd love if possible, if you can share that order. I mean, perhaps many listening would know exactly the order. Now, of course, I understand what you're saying, and maybe we can share it with those online as well. Yeah, sure. Again, what did we start? How did this movement start? Mm. Jesus is coming soon. That arrests the attention. Then from there, you move into actually Revelation chapter 14. Take a look at it. Mm. Uh, I saw another angel go out, you know, uh, fear God, give glory to him. Uh, The hour of his judgment has come, worship him who made. You know, the everlasting gospels where I start. Then by the next weekend, I'm literally into Daniel 8 and 9. Really, Mm. Sean? You're still doing Daniel 8 and 9? Yeah, that's the judgment hour and all that. And it's incredibly good news. And the audience eats that up. They've never seen anything like that. In America, you've got a significant number of people who were raised on Daniel 9 without even knowing it, and they learned it from a dispensational point of view, whether they're Christians or not. Secret rapture and the atheists make fun of that. When you pull that chapter apart, oh my goodness, you've got them. Then the next weekend, the law and the Sabbath, and then I follow that up with baptism, and then the health message, and then the remnant church, and then they're in. Uh, You don't have to do any arm twisting. It's not necessary. Sure. Uh, what is the age uh, that are coming? Do you see a lot of Gen Zers? Uh, yep, vast I do. different amount of. Um, it seems to be evenly spread, and by following the council, and again, you know, Javier, we could spend three hours just on subject order, um, yeah. and maybe we should get together sometime. I, I'd be willing to do that. Let's take some time and go through all that. Um, but if you do it right, it's evenly spread. People say, "Well, what do you get?" You know. And look at me, I'm 54. You put my face on a handbill and everyone expects me to get the old. Now, God's blessing it. I get everything from about, in the audience, 16 to 75, and it seems fairly evenly spread. You don't change region by region, but it is evenly spread. And the number of younger people that come in and make really solid decisions is growing because they they don't have, they don't have 
an existential base in their life. They don't have an epistemological base in their life. And you're handing them one. Here is who you are. Here is where you come from. Here is how your life could mean something. And if you start preaching with those questions in mind, you can take our, um, our message and absolutely captivate the Gen Zs. Right. So you're in, in that case, you're trying to refocus the essence of identity, right? Which is a big conversation That's it. and a big topic. Without attacking. Right. Without attacking. You've got to be subtle. You don't go out and say, here's why I don't believe. Well, why would you take an adversarial hmm. approach? Hmm. That, that doesn't work. Uh, and I'm also heavier. This is going to surprise some people. I'm not after everybody. It's like, you're not after everybody? No, hmm. it doesn't work. Preaching for everybody is going to let you down. If you take a look uh, at, what is it, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul's quite clear that the secular mind cannot grasp spiritual concepts. Good luck to you. Good luck. You're after those that God is waking up. The spirit wakes up the heart. They become curious about spiritual matters. That's your audience. Hmm. You're going after those that God is winning. And you're showing them where that voice is leading them. With that approach, I watched our results go up five and tenfold overnight. You're focused on what is ripe now. Right. So I think what you're saying is that when you're, when you're doing these long meetings, the focus is on reaching the people that one senses God is bringing to these meetings. We're, we're not, we're not uh, trying to reach Adventist, if I can say it that way, and correct me if I'm nope. wrong, which is no. great that they're obviously supporting and being reminded of these messages and hopefully they're empowered and inspired to go and tell others about the beauty of Jesus within these beautiful doctrines, if I can say it that way, that we believe, this, sure. this beautiful message that we believe. But what you're trying to say is that your focus is on those that the Spirit of God is bringing to these meetings. Is that, is that yeah, fair to say? That's it. That's exactly right. Uh, I approach it like this. When we pull into a community, I will work a community for three years before I dare hold a meeting. And the job is a scavenger hunt. Let's go find what's waking up right now. Not everybody, but then we teach people, look, here's how you recognize somebody who is waking up. Here is how you recognize somebody who might be interested. Let them do more talking. Avenus talk too much. I'm one of them. We talk too much at people. Mm. Do more listening. God will show you who's ready. He really will if you spend more time listening and loving than you do lecturing and being right. Our job is not to be right. Uh, our job, and we are right, and that's not what I'm saying. You know, send your critical letters to Gene Boonstra at Pucks, <laughs> nine 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 Loveland, Colorado. No, but you know, the um, we're not trying to be right. We're trying to identify God's children and invite them home. That's a completely different exercise. Uh, being right drives people away. We are right, but they'll recognize that if they've been hearing the Spirit of God. What happens when you open a Bible with these people is they recognize the voice that inspired the book. They go, "That sounds familiar." That sounds right, and that's our exercise. We find them. So it's a scavenger hunt. And sometimes in a community, we'll do, we just did a marriage seminar in a European city uh, for a day and packed the room out. We couldn't believe it. No one knows how to have a relationship anymore. That was popular. Yeah. And several of them are now attending church. People go, really? That's it? Just a few? Out of you know 400 that showed up, you had a few? That's right. That's one tap. You turn it on and it's dripping. Then maybe we do something with health and exercise in the community and a, you know, a health fair. Two more drips. Mm. But if you turn them all on, you get a flood after about 18 months. Turn them all on. Go find these people. They're everywhere. Join clubs. Go to a meetup and make friends and love and listen. God will show you who's ready. You don't have to twist arms. If they're ready, they're going to come. Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate that, Sean. And so to come full circle, essentially Voice of Prophecy Currently, four ways that you talked about is the Bible study school, Discover. And right. for those, I'm assuming, perhaps most will know, but those that may not, that are, are listening, you mentioned that every church could have their own specific website that does That's online right. Bible studies. And Absolutely we'll have a link right. for that, that you're going to make sure that people can. Well, I'll tell you what, yeah. everything I've described is all found at one website. VOP. Evangelism. No, evangelismcycle.com. Okay. There are worksheets that help you figure out what could our church afford? What could we do? What could we try? And it shows every toy we've developed. Toy is a bad word, I guess. But, you know, it occurred to me when I started working in media ministry that I suddenly had all the nice toys. It's true. I earned the same as a pastor, but I had access to the nice toys. I wanted to give those away. You'll see all of our nice toys at evangelismcycle.com. Okay. I'll make sure to put that on the show notes there. And the people listening could go on there right now if they'd like. 
And so you got the Bible study school, you got Discovery Mountain, which right. is it's still a, as as a person who's had a podcast for going on eight years and it's been audio only. And of course, I always get the, when are you going to put it on video thing? I know, I know. But with that said, it's really fascinating that Discover Mountain for kids is only audio and has, as you have been mentioning, has just been increasing in listenership around the world, which is just fascinating to me as well. Yeah, I've Absolutely. It's grown so fast. It's There's only two people. My wife writes every show. Hmm. She's the producer and she has an assistant and that's it. Um, and it's catching up on Adventures in Odyssey right now. We're closing in on their market. Hmm. Awesome. The bridge events that people yep. can look into and then, of course, the full scale message, which that would be more calling into uh, VOP and, and making the plans necessary to, to do something right. with you specifically. I've invested untold sums of money in what you will get is editable. Uh, it is for uh, 6K graphics, brand new, um, and looks contemporary. It doesn't look any more like it was made by Jehovah's Witnesses in 1971. <laughs> um, you know, it just, it, and, and the most important thing is, is that it's got the coaching in it. If you've never done it, do it as it is the first time, but it's going to equip you to rewrite it and fight in your own armor. I appreciate that, Sean. John, you've already kind of touched on it, but I'd like to ask you, because you really have a good pulse to where we're at in culture, I would say, just in conversing with you on and off the air. But what what do you believe are some of the current challenges? And again, we've briefly touched on some of them already, but what do you believe are some of the current challenges to reaching this hyper-polarized culture? And, and along with that, and then I'll let you go at it, is what, what are some of the practical ways in which we can seek to overcome those challenges. Right. Uh, let me say this. It's a double-edged sword because, yeah, well, culture is definitely a challenge. Point to one time in Christian history, other than, let's say, the 1950s, or there's a, a handful of spots where we, we lined up with the dominant culture. But in 2,000 years, that's seldom been true. We have always been countercultural. We've always, I mean, read Acts, what is it, Acts chapter 14, Paul goes to Lystra and they try to worship him as Zeus. I mean, come on, man. You want to talk cultural misunderstandings. And yet you'll notice in that passage, he sticks with the message anyway, preaches the first angel's message. If you look at it carefully, he does it in the context of the great controversy. He's like a really good Adventist evangelist, but he's addressing a culture. So yeah, are we countercultural? Yes. Does that discourage me? Not at all, because that's always been true. As a matter of fact, being countercultural, uh, is actually helpful, I find. I'm finding right now that this is our best moment ever. I'm finding more decisions that come earlier from the audiences, and they're more solid than they used to be. Uh, for example, let's say I teach the Sabbath. Now, and that's three weeks in, but I teach the Sabbath. And normally, I put out a card, does this make sense to you? We're very, you know, there's no hard sell, no arm twisting. And I'll get 30, and everybody says, you know, Sean, out of 1,800 people, you got 30? Yeah. That's pretty good for it. They just learned it yesterday for crying out sideways, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's pretty, I'm excited. 30 within 24 hours, tomorrow will be another 30 and another 30. Lately, that number has almost tripled. Mm. The decisions come hard and fast. And uh, so I'm finding that it's actually better now than it ever has been. But polarization is the word you used. And that's probably our biggest challenge, both inside and outside the church. So example, I'll have people come to the meeting and they want to know right away, are you for or against Trump? Are you kidding me? Really? No, no. I'm for this book. I don't pay much attention to politics, I tell them, which hmm. uh, is mostly true because as a preacher, you got to remove that. Come on, man. You want to lose half the room with your political opinion? Hmm. Don't. Don't do it. Why would you do that? Why would you drive half the room away from the gospel? It doesn't matter which side you fall on in politics. And I'm a political junkie. Leave it out. Uh, they're already polarized and I brush it aside. No, no, I'm not Biden. I'm not Trump. I'm not Hillary. I'm not, you know, I'm not those things. So they're polarized. But our other problem is that our own people are starting to polarize. They're actually drifting away from our message and they're starting to look at what's going on in the world of geopolitics and trying to identify it with who we are. And, you know, our council's pretty clear. Stay away from that. Don't touch it. God will handle the politics. It, he, I, I think that's in Testimonies Volume 5. Stay away from it. Go do your work. God will keep us free long enough to do that. Stay away from the politics. But our people are polarized. And worse than that, we're starting to follow in the footsteps of a lot of evangelical churches 
and really love conspiracy theories. And somehow we replace our message in the gospel with a conspiracy theory, whether it's political or whatever, uh, those kinds of things. And when you focus people back on winning souls, a lot of that begins to dissipate. Uh, no, people matter. Uh, Jesus matters. Uh, but it's polarization inside and out. And our own people are trying to identify with political parties for crying out sideways mm. inside the church. And it's like, okay, that's an absolute challenge. And probably the biggest challenge, and this is much, this is true, not just recently, but over the years, is our isolationism. We have this, what I call, look, I, I, in, in politics, I won't identify which party I was identified with as a young person, but I was very engaged. I, I trained under one American president to run political campaigns when I was 17 years old. Mm. He ran a school, this president. Uh, I learned a lot about evangelism in there. Man, we could do an hour on what politics taught me about soul winning. But he said, you guys are, you guys are going to lose your campaign because you have Sir Galahad syndrome. And I was curious, what's Sir Galahad syndrome? And this is something that exists in our church. He said, you think you're a knight of the round table. And because you're correct and right, you are noble and true. All you have to do is sit back and let the winning start. Hmm. And our churches think that way. We have the truth. All we have to do is open the doors and the people will pour in. And then our churches shrink and die. And we have empty seats in the pews and more and more gray hair all the time. And we wonder what happened. Hmm. Well, you're not doing what God told us to do. You have Sir Galahad th uh, syndrome. Our job is not to be right. That's not our job. God is right. Mm. And I know we always have a few in the congregation. This can be a problem too. They're right about everything. They're the little pope in their congregation. They're right about everything. And I always say, look, if your angel sat down and gave you a Bible study on what you still had wrong tonight, how do you think that would go? Mm. Go love people. Go love those people. That's what we've been called to do and get out of the door. So our isolationism is another big uh, issue that we've got. We don't know. How many Adventists know, have 10 good non Adventist friends? Mm, yeah. We, we think we understand the world and we don't even understand. We're the oddballs. Mm. We think that the world is weird. We treat them like they're weird. We're the weird ones. Get out there and know people. Love them. Listen more than you talk. Really appreciate that, Sean. Thank you for your transparency and, and for your challenge to get out there and love people. And back to what you were saying before, to listen to people. And it's something that I'm still working on. I mean, this I've said this before on the podcast. The podcast has helped me quite a bit, but I'm still learning. I'm still learning to be a better listener oh, to too. people. I, I often realize that I don't have to say much, but I have to listen a lot more, and it works a lot better that way at the end. And again, I'm still working on that oh, yeah. even after all these years. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah, it is. If we don't learn to listen to people, uh, remember Henry Blackaby about 30, 40 years ago, whatever it was, you know, uh, yeah. experiencing can, God. Experiencing God, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he taught what was basically Wesleyan provenient grace. God's working with these people. Don't get in the way. Listen to them. Listen to them. Love them. Otherwise, we start to answer questions that people aren't asking. So with that said, Sean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of go in this same lane that we're speaking to, but maybe even try to make it even further practical for the person listening, the, the pastor, the leader, church member. Sean goes and is currently a pastor of the local church. You're no longer right. at Voice of Prophecy, Sean. You've officially been employed yep. by the Florida Conference. They have no idea that I'm no, just doing that this. Doesn't sound, that doesn't sound too bad. Hey, come on down. And uh, you're, <laughs> at, you're at the local church now. And okay. uh, you can put whatever size church you want to put in there. What are some of the okay. ways that, and, and, and again, we've already hinted at, at and talked about some of these ways, but what are some of the ways that you would recommend that you would lead forward and empowering your local congregation to do some of the things that we're talking about, to do evangelism, to be a disciple that makes disciple, to get out there as we've been talking about, to listen better? How would you help the local congregations in this aspect that we've been discussing, which is... I understand there's no simple answer, I would venture to say. No, but, there isn't. But let's maybe unpack it and, and uh, see how the Lord leads. Well, listen, um, one of the first things I would do, and this is going to frustrate some church members, but you stay the course. Um, if it comes time for church board meeting, the number one thing I used to put on the agenda, and I still would to this day, after opening prayer is soul winning plans mm. before anything else. 
The departmental reports can come later. Even the financials can come later. Let's talk about what we're going to do in this city. That's the first thing. And that's going to take up 50% of our time at church board. And that's going to be true everywhere we go. It's the first thing on the agenda. Then suddenly, once you lay a strategy, it could be simple. This year, we're going to whatever, you know, we're going to run a health fair, whatever it is. Um, then suddenly the departmental reports all tee in. Well, you know what the pathfinders could do to help that. Do you know what the elders should be doing for that? And it'll frustrate some who love to be taken care of and entertained. Uh, you have to move forward, press on past that. The second thing is to choose to believe. Nothing will work if you don't believe it will. People tell me evangelism doesn't work. The number one reason evangelism doesn't work is because you chose to believe it wouldn't. Hmm. It's remarkable how well it works if you choose to exercise a little faith. God's not using us so much to win the world. He is, you know, don't get me wrong, but he doesn't really need us. He's using this to restore our faith. He, he basically opens the curtains on the church and says, look outside at that world. I want you to go preach this message to those people. And we shake our heads. Are you kidding me? Have you seen it out there? The gender confusion and the postmodern thinking and the relativism, this message to those people. And God smiles and says, yeah, this message, hmm. those people do it my way. I think you're going to see something interesting. That's a leap of faith. And so I'm always building faith. If, I, if, if I'm going to go out visiting, take a church member with you, take them with you. And you might only have two that are willing out of 50. Fine. Two is fine. Next Sabbath, I'm bringing that person up. Hey, we went to a home. Tell me what, what you saw in that home. And you, start, you just start featuring it before the sermon. That's more important than the sermon some weeks. Hey, what, what did you do in the community? Hey, I understand you went over and met your neighbor and brought them a loaf of bread and had a conversation. Tell the congregation what happened. You'll start getting the volunteers list growing and growing as you keep modeling success and ministry and mission in front of everybody. Those would be first steps for me. But then we're going to make a plan and we're going to work it and we're going to stick with it and we're going to choose to believe it's going to work. Hmm. So I love the the essence that when many of us, uh, when I say us, pastors, leaders have heard this before, right? But it's always oh, good yeah. to be reminded to make so winning number one on the agenda on your church board, no matter the size of the church, right? And that, that should right. flow is what you're saying. That should flow to every other department, whatever it is. Uh, even, of course, Pathfinders, Adventures, everything. Um, the school, whatever. If you've got a school yes. in your district, right. yeah. And look, I've had churches with 12 members. I've had them with hundreds. Um, it, it'll work. You scale it to what you can do, and God will bless that, and it starts to snowball. Some of the grumblers will start to tell you, well, that wouldn't work very well. Mm. No, but it worked. We're not going to quit now. Snowballs grow over time. It starts as a trickle, and it becomes a flood. We're going to work it. It takes a little bit of determination to not vary from the plan because people are grumbling. Yeah. Um, and there's a handful. Eventually. You need to send the message, this is what we're doing. You may not like it. You may not enjoy it. You may not be on board, but you should understand this is what we're doing. Hmm. Uh, and they've got a choice at that point. Eventually, they come on board or they attend another congregation. That sounds cold, but you know, single-mindedness, that's really what we're talking about. Right. And, and I like that you're, you follow that by, say, by, by saying believe. It's, I, I found that interesting that you put that word, which is, not not just believe and correct me if I'm wrong. Not just believe in evangelism, which you mentioned, but what I also heard was the essence of believing in that God is working, that God is working yeah. not only through evangelism, but that God is working through the local church. I know you didn't say those words, but it seems to me like when you say that word believe, is, oh, that, yeah. is that sometimes we're we're more perhaps concerned about things that may not work, which of course we. Have to have those discussions, but also believe that God is working is what I'm trying to say. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's exactly right. Sometimes it didn't work because you didn't believe it. Sometimes it didn't work because you did the wrong thing. That happens. I'm willing to take 19 losses for one win. Mm. Come on, man. If if we fought World War II the way that we run churches sometimes, we'd all be speaking German. It's like, oh my goodness, they shot back. Mercy. <laughs> Mercy. Yeah, of course the devil shoots back. What did you think was going to happen? Have you read the New Testament? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, it's choose to believe that God put you in that community at this moment for a reason and he's going to use you. Right. And then the pastor needs to understand, I'm not here to perform. I'm here to coach. Mm. I'm here to coach. I'm here to help these church members find their place in God's work. 
whatever that is, whether it's a prayer warrior or they're going to preach a meeting or whatever it is that they're going to do, you're coaching people to be self-sufficient in their faith. And then you can move on. The church won't need a pastor after that. Mm. Yeah. The, the uh, essence of collaboration modeling is what you were saying. And then yeah. of course, have an ultimate plan. And I love it. Sounds simple, not simplistic because you have to stick to it and believe as we were it's saying, hard work. And pray and everything else that, that uh, we know uh, God calls us to do at the local level. And when it comes to discipleship, we, we briefly mentioned about it earlier. It's a journey that in this podcast, we've had many conversations about not just what, how we've been discussing evangelism and discipleship here so far, but many conversations specifically about discipleship. Many have, uh, within those conversations, sometimes it's been said that that's one area where perhaps our local churches are struggling in, right? And the sense of disciples that are really making disciples. It's it's right. a, it's my own personal journey that I, you and I talked about it before I pressed record. It's a journey that I'm really trying to focus more and more on that I want to be a disciple that makes disciples. And it's an ongoing journey. And so let me ask you, Sean, in your in your personal life, how are you in your day-to-day life seeking to be a disciple that makes disciples, right? So not just the Sean uh, from VOP that preaches these big meetings and that's uh, doing all this incredible resourcing for the local church, but just in your day-to-day walk, maybe share with us, how are you seeking in your journey to be a disciple that makes disciples? Boy, that's a big question. All of your questions have here could go for like hours. That's um, great. But <laughs> yeah, but okay. Number one, I fight the urge to be institutional. I don't know how many times I've had a call to an institutional church and I thought, Sean, do you want to live in an inst- in an Adventist ghetto or do you want to live with the with with your tribe, the barbarians? I want to live with my tribe. So I never lose sight of that. I always quietly, I don't want to lose my edge. I always quietly have several Bible studies going on. And I got to tell you right now, the kids I went to college and high school with, they're asking me questions. Can I study the Bible? I can't even believe it. They used to make fun of me and now they're asking. Mm. Uh, so I keep that edge sharp. Secondly, I don't just have in mind a baptism. That's not the finish line for somebody that you're leading to Christ. I put them to work doing what I do. After all, that's what they were excited about. I always, you know, if I held a meeting and I baptized, let's say, eight new church members, um, they're the most keen. I teach them to do what I do. I say, I'm going to do this again. Come help me. How about you preach tonight? How about you go visit this person? How about you run this event? And I literally give everybody, I know what we do. Oh, that new person, they need to be here for a couple of years before we give them a a church post. Sean, you're really going to make them the personal ministry director? And he's been here two months. Yep, I am. Do you know why? He's going to make all kinds of mistakes and embarrass all of us, but he's going to do it and he's going to win souls. It's all. I put them to work right away. I don't entertain them. I don't patronize people. Uh, Same with young people. Don't patronize your young people. Put them to work. If there's one book I could recommend to everybody, it's 1958, I believe, Notre Dame Press, Douglas Hyde, Dedication and Leadership. He is a, um, he is a, he was a communist living in England, a Marxist who becomes a Catholic Christian, uh, and then wonders why we patronize people when at that time in the 50s, the Soviets ran one third of the Earth's geography with only 50,000 party members. Mm. One third of the Earth's geography. What did they do? They went to the young people. And, and Douglas Hyde describes what he calls the starry-eyed idealism of youth. He said, why do you think 17-year-olds are willing to take an AK-47 and go live in the jungles of Central America? Hmm. Because you gave them a vision and they put them to work. They don't patronize them. And uh, here's what's fascinating, written by a former communist. Uh, Ronald Reagan used that. He had, the, he had the youngest support base in the history of American politics and was the oldest candidate at the time that had ever run. And his support base was 18 to 20 years old. Why? He gave them real jobs, real responsibility, put them in charge of things, and they, they, they conquered the world. Don't entertain people. It's not over at baptism. Give them real responsibility. Keep coaching, holding their hand, replicate what you do. Jesus spent three and a half years focused more on training 12 than he did on winning the whole world by himself. Mm, mm. Impactful reminder to make sure that in our discipleship life that we are bringing people along, giving them responsibility of all ages, I think is what you're saying. Certainly uh, those that are young, as you mentioned. Oh, young in the faith or chronologically? Right. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. 
and just empowering them and coming alongside them and understanding that they're going to make mistakes like we all have and like we all continue to do because, I mean, uh, last I checked, you and I have, uh, I think, already made several mistakes just in our conversations, perhaps. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, um, and, and, and then learn from them and continue to walk with them. Again, we're talking about discipleship here in the day-to-day life, right? And um, thank you for that. Thank you for we're, that reminder. Yeah, we're too, we're too afraid of mistakes too, Javier. Mm. It's like- Tell it, me more. Yeah, you, you really think you're not going to make any mistakes, people? Nobody wants a religious know-it-all up front. Mm. That's over. That's been over for decades. Yeah. They want a real human being. So I mess up. I'd rather mess. Of course, I'm going to mess up. You know, God didn't put angels in charge of this work. He put us in charge of this work, knowing full well we're going to blow it. We're going to embarrass him from occasionally. Fine. You know, that's the joy of the gospel is I am a sinner and I'm broken and he wants to use me anyway. I'm willing to make some mistakes. I'm willing to have my face turn red once in a while. Hundred mm. percent. And I think I think the beauty of the Spirit of God is that within that journey of the mistakes that we will make is that we will recognize them, that we will repent, that we will learn, oh, that we will empower them. others, right? Of course, yeah. to to um, not just stay where we're at, but to admit, hey, this we didn't we didn't do this right. This didn't nope. we didn't we didn't say the right things, and we're sorry. We apologize. We want to now do better. That's right. In, in, in that's that right. aspect, and and I think that's yeah. the authentic aspect of life that people really love to see and want to see and need to see. People respect an honest, transparent person who makes mistakes more than a defensive know-it-all. Mm, absolutely. Every day. Any day. Um, yeah. So, And if you're going to preach publicly, if I could just one, lose your tie, just do it. <laughs> I know that runs against Avenus culture, but drop it. It used to take me four days to build rapport with a strange audience and feel like we were all really good friends. The day I dropped my tie, it happened in, 40, in 48 hours. Mm. It, it's it's weird, right? But again, nobody trusts the know-it-all. The day American presidents stopped wearing ties to press conferences, it was over. Hmm. Well, there you go, everybody. Uh, Pastor Sean Booster of West of Prophecy says no more ties for any kind of meetings or. I know that's going to rub some people <laughs> wrong, though. You know, but but I don't. I wear jeans, cowboy boots, and a button-up shirt and a blazer. You know what? You got to find the middle ground, sure. right? Then. Yeah. Hey, I appreciate it, Sean. Sean, thank you so much for your time. I've had an, a this has been a fascinating conversation. I can go on for hours, and but I know that both of us have other appointments that we have to do. But before that, this year I'm trying to ask here in 2024, as we're again been doing this for a bit. I want to go back early on. I used to do this here and there, but I want to ask a few, right. few different questions here when I'm finishing the conversation from time to time. And so I just thought I'd start with you, Sean. And and I don't think it's anything okay. out of this world, but per se. But with that said, Sean, what is the best advice anyone's ever given you and why? Oh my oh my goodness. Just one? And you can do more than one if you want. Three three or four. Okay, there ahead. are three or four that are kind of landmarks on my horizon. And why? One I, is, and why? One 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 is from Charles Spurgeon. Okay. Um, I didn't know him, obviously. I'm not that old, but <laughs> Charles Spurgeon once said, maybe it's apocryphal, I don't know, but he once said, learn how to say no. It's more useful than Latin. Hmm. And I laughed because I took Latin in college. It's like, oh, yeah, I guess that would. And I'm not good at no. Um, give up the people pleasing. You can't do everything everybody wants, and you shouldn't be doing everything everybody wants anyway. Reject distractions is what it boils down to. Say no to that which is not on mission. Mm. Just say no. And you don't owe an explanation for why. Sorry, that's not what I'm doing right now. That's enough. That's enough. So learn how to say no. Stop entertaining people. Engage, recruit, and empower them, right? The starry-eyed idealism of youth. I got that from uh, a leadership institute in Alexandria, Virginia, when I was training as a young politician. Um, Don't entertain people. Get rid of the Sir Galahad thing, too. Just engage, recruit, and empower them. I learned that from a politician. He said, you want to build a campus club for this political party? Put a table in the hallway. And when you get someone who seems excited about what your um, your content is, excuse yourself, go to the bathroom, and ask them if they'll watch the table for a minute. Go down the hall and watch them for 10 minutes. <laughs> and you'll know who your leaders are in five minutes, man. Um, don't entertain folks. Recruit, engage, replicate. Uh, 
Um, an evangelist once told me, if you're going to use humor, use it wisely. Ellen White used humor. That's going to rub some people's fur the wrong way, but she absolutely did. But it needs to be self-deprecating. You don't mock others. It's got to be self-deprecating. People can appreciate that. This is a, as a humble person. And again, none of this is about me. An evangelist said one, to me one time, none of it's about us. It's about Jesus. Get out of the way. Mm. Learn to say no. Stop entertaining. That's right. I mean, you, can, it's, it, you better be a little entertaining. I, I want to clarify okay. that. You're fighting against TikTok, YouTube, and you know, those sure. kinds of things. You've got to be engaging. Engaging is a better word than entertaining for a preacher. At least be interesting. Oh, that was one more. One, one evangelist pulled me aside when I got started and said, whatever you do, try to be interesting. Okay. I'm not sure where to take that. I mean, how, how, so how, how have no, you he tried didn't, to he be didn't. interesting? Well, I, number one, I ask myself, what interests people? And I study people and I read a lot. I try to read two, two books a week. I, I only sleep four hours a night. So I read two wow. books a week. And, um, I, uh, and I don't recommend that. That's going to kill you, but it's the way I am wired. And I want to know, not just Avenus books. No, don't just, you know, I love, sure. hey, Pacific Press, a good friend. Dale Galush is a good friend. Uh, but start reading what people are reading. Find out what they're interested in. What's selling. And be interesting. Be interesting. Be interesting. Know what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. And I love the one that you said just a few moments ago as well. Um, when it comes to advice, that, that is a great reminder. It's not about us. It's about it's not. Jesus. Yeah, if you if you lead people to you, that's a pretty dead end. Mm. Mercy, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Sean, I've really appreciated having this conversation. Um, before I let you go, any last thoughts to those that will be listening? Choose to believe that God did not make a mistake when He raised up this movement and gave it this assignment. I sometimes have fun with this saying. Can you picture God today saying, uh, "Gabriel, get a pen and paper. We're got to call a meeting." Uh, three Angels message was completely wrong. I didn't see the postmoderns. I didn't see the seculars. I didn't see the you know Gen Z coming. I didn't see any of that. We need a complete rewrite. And people laugh. Well, of course, that's not going to happen. That's right. So choose to believe he didn't make a mistake. Yes, you have to contextualize. You've got to speak a language people understand. You've got to understand their point of view, where they're coming from, what they have as an epistemological base or not and speak their language. But at the end of the day, choose to believe God did not make a mistake with this assignment. Thank you, Sean. Thank you for your time. Thank you for allowing the Lord to lead your life as you have and what you're doing at The Voice of Prophecy. And may God continue to bless you, your family, and your ministry. Oh, hey, and thanks for having me on. Again, way more fun than working. Now I got to go down to the studio and do real work. <laughs> Well, blessings on that, man. We will certainly have you back on soon. Blessings to you. Hey, thank you. And to you too. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation. I know I did. Sean, thank you again for your time and continued blessings to you, your family, and your ministry at The Voice of Prophecy and just overall. To all of you listening, thank you. Thank you for taking a, your time to listen to The Restored Podcast. And if you feel that you've been blessed by this or any other episode, I hope that you will share it with others. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to the Restore Podcast so that you don't miss any of our monthly episodes. Until next time, God bless. Thank you for listening to this Restore Podcast. We hope you've been blessed. Don't forget to subscribe so you won't miss any of our inspiring episodes.